I'm Kelly Greenwood. I'm a landscape designer. I live in La Honda, California. Hi, my name is Lance Cornell. I'm an architect. I'm from Brentwood, California. I chose to be a landscape designer because it was a wonderful way of combining my love of science with my love of art. I always wanted to be an architect, ever since I had a, my first set of Legos. It's really inspired me to be creative, to use my math and science to really design something I really wanted to see. Landscape design is an art that's about creating spaces for people to live in, for people to do what's meaningful to them. Architecture to me is a way to really express yourself and to really create something that's from your heart, to take everything around you and to really meld it into something that makes a difference. My style is really based on California natives and well-adapted Mediterranean plants. This is a garden I designed in Palo Alto, California. This garden is very small. The planting areas around the edge, many of them are only 18 inches deep. So a lot of it's about being vertical. Vertical like this with leaves and vertical with lots of other things. Many of my gardens are about the leaves. This is a great example. This is elephant's ear, taro, which is from Southeast Asia. I don't know if we'll see any of this on our trip, but this was planted about eight years ago, and I've always had a fascination with many Southeast Asian plants. In this case, I paired it with something very California, roses. There's also lots of tropical things like hibiscus in this garden because it's all about the pool. This garden is basically as big as the pool and a little bit more. So it's a great party pad, a great social space for the family, and it really behaves like an additional room in their house. My architecture style is more modern, more clean line, a lot of use of materials, and a real good sense of detailing. I designed this arch back in 2010 to really bring all the visual elements of Brentwood down into one landmark. The Mount Diablo hillside that you can see there is depicted across the arch, and the rolling hills towards Livermore to the south of us are depicted in the columns. The landmark was really designed as a way to create a gateway to the downtown area and to also let you know that this is where you're at when you come to downtown. I'm kind of like a big kid. I'm, I'm always seeing new things that interest me and, and landscape design is a way that I get to play with all of those things and put them together and make people happy. The thing I like most about my job is the fact that I'd never do anything the same from day to day. It's always a challenge, it's always creative, it's always changing. I designed this fountain back in 2010. It's off the main street in Brentwood. I designed it to create a tactile fountain where kids can touch and play with it and sort of spray water around. Also to create a landmark downtown where people can say, hey, I'm gonna meet you at the fountain. I have never been to China before. I've never been to China before. The only thing I know about the Suzhou Gardens at this point is what I've read online about it being the sort of Venice of China, that it's a very ancient city with a lot of canals and water. When I think of the Suzhou Gardens, it really excites me because it's something that I've never seen before and I'm really excited to experience it. We're gonna be traveling to Suzhou for 10 days, visiting some really interesting ancient Chinese gardens. It's always been a dream of mine to visit Asia, and China in particular, so I'm super excited to go. I'm so excited to go. <laughs>
Suzhou is over 2,500 years old. It's an ancient, ancient city. And in terms of its size, it's about six times the size of LA, which makes it massive and old. Suzhou seems to be just formed by the water everywhere around. There are canals, rivers, boats. It's a water city. Suzhou has been a very prosperous city for a thousand years. Think about that. What city in the States is even 200 years old? And this place, a thousand years of prosperity. So there's some incredible trades, incredible craftsmanship that goes on here. But what's really interesting about Suzhou is its gardens. At one time, there were as many as 270 of these gardens. Today is our first day in Suzhou. Uh, we're here at the Couples Retreat Garden here. The garden itself is a three-dimensional poem. The first experience of the garden is to enter through this formal reception room where most people would have come in, which is full of carvings and calligraphy and hand-painted lanterns. And at the centerpiece of this room is a larger stone that's set in a very special place of honor. And then you come back out again into a smaller courtyard that had three beautiful Hu stones in them. And they're punctuated with these holes and smooth and airy. They're positioned upright so that you can see through them. After you move through that courtyard, you come around to the right and it opens out into a very large open area. And this mountain of Huang-style rock is in the center. There's all these pathways, nooks and crannies, I'm sure you can see that, I mean, I feel like I'm perched in an awesome playhouse. There's these incredible little paths everywhere and you just can't help but explore and feel a little bit like a kid climbing up and down. And they're sculpted in such a way and mortared in such a way that you can create all these separate pathways around it. And the pavilion next to these rockeries have an excellent view onto them. The pavilions are kind of like the bookmark for the book. And they stop you in your tracks and allow you to reference the garden from a different perspective. And as you walk into each one of these pavilions, you can stop and see a tree or the edge of a rockery. And you don't quite get a sense of what's happening until you pause until you really become present in the space and you really feel what it means to be in a contemplative space. The main pavilion has a view, a long view of the pool. This one behind me here. There's calligraphy on both sides that have poems that tell you about what you're going to see. The garden artists felt that the poetry helped to name and frame the space so that you understood kind of what to reflect on when you're there viewing the scene. This one that I'm looking at across the pond is my favorite. This is the moon viewing pavilion. When I first got to this pavilion, I'm thinking, how do you even see the moon through this pavilion? I'm looking up, there's an evergreen loquat tree, beautifully pruned, it's this elegant umbrella shape over the pavilion. I'm thinking, how do I look up through this tree to see the moon? I'm not gonna see the moon here but you look down into the pool and you see this incredible reflection, the color and the light. It's like beautiful old glass that when you see this whole perfect matching world down below, I can just imagine artists looking down and seeing the moon in this pond and being inspired to create more poetry and paintings. So the left-hand side gardens have this rockery and pavilion area where the pavilion is centered on the rockery in such a way that there's always a little movement in your pathway. Nothing is truly axial or symmetrical in this garden. There are some really interesting examples of uh, Hu stones as well, the tall Swiss cheese-like stones. So we had a lot of fun exploring the progression of the courtyards over there and the, the really tight choreography of what you see and how the view is controlled so that you see this perfect composition when you walk through. We were working through this great interplay between shadow and light and solid and void 
and moving through spaces and walking through these circuitous little pathways that reveal themselves to painting-like portraits of gardens and trees and ponds. It was really a magical space. So as I'm walking around this garden, I can't help but notice all the little patterns on the ground, the fine pebble mosaics all over the ground space. There's pathways of pebble mosaics. It opens out into patios. It, it blends the spaces in this incredible rhythm, triangles, flowers, all kinds of different shapes. So I'm having so much fun seeing all the different plants that are around here. There's some amazing old friends that I know well from California. We use a lot of bamboos. There's some wonderful short bamboos all the way around. This wisteria is absolutely incredible. This wisteria has to be 100 years old. When that thing blooms, those little purple grape-like clusters of blossoms would just be hanging right over the water. It would just blow my mind to see this in spring. One of the things I really enjoy about this garden, and I think I'm gonna see this throughout my trip, is that these pathways are always turning. And if you have a garden that's straight and linear, you would just walk right through it. But gardens like this, there's twists and there's turns, which causes you to slow down and pause, almost like a visual speed bump, where you are forced to confront what's in front of you and then change your view depending on where the path leads you. It's a genius move to do it as a garden design, to put in those turns. When we finally worked our way through most of the garden and the buildings, there's a boat dock where there's uh, gondolas waiting for you. We step into this little old wooden boat that's creaking. This beautiful lady, 66-year-old lady, comes in and just as bright as you can be, starts singing. And uh, we didn't quite know what the song was, and uh, through our translator, it was a folk song for the city of Suzhou, and uh, about the different flowers and the different months of the year, and what it all meant. And it really punctuated the whole experience with a beautiful song and wonderful rhythm of her singing. It took us an entire day to explore this space and understand all the riches it has to offer and unveil all these different secrets. And to finish it with a song was truly magical. I have to say that I'm never going to design the same way again. Just today, these gardens feel so lush. It feels so big on the inside, but they're small and they're surrounded by walls. They're entirely designed to look in. For those of us who live in townhouses and tight, small gardens, Really thinking about how to create a garden that is interesting, help you think about the things in your life that are meaningful and to find peace and joy in your space, in your home. What really inspired me today was how meticulously designed a space can be. The people who designed it, the people who worked on it are all gone. But the only thing that lasting is the work. And if anything, that is the greatest influence that I take from this visit. So here we are at day two. We're at the Lions Grove Garden here in Suzhou. This garden is on a much grander scale. It's about two and a half acres. This garden is famous here. It was added to the list of UNESCO World Heritage Sites in 2000, along with eight other gardens in Suzhou. The garden starts off with a series of halls and courtyards. The first hall, the ancestral hall, was the main arrival point where all guests would have been received. And it feels very grand. The height is impressive, the size, the scale of everything is so big. Between the ancestral hall and the hall of joyous feasts, the little hallway opens out into a larger courtyard. The courtyard has a pebble mosaic on the ground, and has a, a wonderful Chinese symbol and lucky signs around it. The surrounding bats represent luck. In the Chinese language, the word bat is very similar to the word luck. 
These two here represent health and longevity. And as you stand on in front of the hall and look back toward the ancestral hall, and there's this incredible rockery. It's a rock formation with a tree and some rock sculptures standing up with a patinaed white background. And as you're walking through that and you orient yourself in a certain way, you really get a frame view of what would be living ancient Chinese art. And then you turn around and the Hall of Joyous Feasts, which was where all the parties were held. Which has two different sides to it. There's a male side and a female side. The female side is quite whimsical because it's the first time I've seen colored glass in one of these pavilions. Once we stepped through the Hall of Joyous Feasts, there was another small courtyard featured a massive Hu stone piece. Huge, much broader than the stones we've seen before. The rock itself is a true piece of art. And just standing back on the porch of that little pavilion, you can contemplate this rock for ages. But the tease is that there's these little doorways in the side of the courtyard that lead you directly out into the garden. So if you want to take a shortcut, you can slip through one of those little side doors out into the garden. If you don't take the shortcut, you take a longer route through the most beautiful little crabapple blossom shaped gate. And you go through that, you're confronted with this beautiful pavilion off to the right hand side. And when you sit in this pavilion, you're looking out at the mountain, the first sight that you have of this incredible rockery. The rockery has a lot of depth and dimension to it and you don't quite know how to make it out. It's so massive and so large. People actually are walking on it and in it and experiencing it from different directions and, and going through the different holes and caverns. This rockery is really, really old. When the cathedrals in France were being built, Buddhist monks were assembling the rocks in this garden, carefully, piece by piece. They were rebuilding a garden that had been destroyed before, even earlier. And so we spent some time walking through that and sort of exploring how that space unveils itself. And you get to a certain point and you link up with a covered courtyard, which takes you to the expansive garden that you see behind me. It's a pond with wonderful lotus plants in it and vistas of the rockery and the landscape. The landscape is surrounded by a covered walkway with great pavilions and great vistas. I'm approaching the Lion's Peak, which sits atop the highest point of this wonderful rockery. The Lion's Peak dates back to Huang Dynasty. It's an amazing labyrinth of twists and turns and caves and caverns. If you were a child, you would love this place. You could get lost forever and you feel like you're on planet Dr. Seuss. The Lion Grove gets its name from the upright Hu stones along the top of the rockery. They resemble kind of abstract lions, you know. At the end of the garden is this cement boat. It's quite whimsical. It's sort of a folly in the garden. One of the most renowned emperors in China, Qianlong of the Qing Dynasty, used to love to visit this garden. He would sit up in the pavilion, the pavilion of true charm, and look out across the lake at the lotus blossoms. This rockery is one of the most famous in China. He loved this garden so much, he went and repeated it up north a couple more times, building new gardens up there that resembled the rockery down here. This garden contains some incredibly ancient trees. The ginkgo tree over here is 600 years old. It was quite an interesting day exploring the rockery and seeing how it meant to be in this space and to confront all of these different spaces. If the way through the garden is to keep going forward, to keep exploring, there's always more to discover. You never know what you're going to see around the next corner. This garden was owned by the family of I.M. Pei, who restored it in 1926. Later, in 1954, they gave it to the Republic of China. Later this week, we'll get to visit the Suzhou Museum, which was designed by I.M. Pei.
today we ventured out of Suzhou, about an hour and 20 minutes south to the water town of Tongli. Tongli has been a prosperous town for over a thousand years. We started off our day walking through the old town. We walked over one of the 49 ancient bridges in this town. The town is broken up by 15 different rivers, so everywhere you look, there's an ancient bridge. We were able to see craftsmen working on their trade. We saw a painter painting a... Landscape paintings of bridges. Then as we walked further down the alley, we found a tailor who was making clothes in traditional ways. We walked through a little bit and saw this cotton candy maker who was making a ball of cotton candy for Kelly. There was a silk maker who was making a comforter, pulling the silk by hand. We came across a craftsman making this beautiful comb out of the, this horn. We also saw a guy making candy where he was actually stretching it, making candy by hand, pulling and pulling and twisting and turning, and he's singing the whole time. It was just wonderful. We finished our walk and ended up at this gondola ride. So we step out into the gondola and we get to sit on the front of the boats and hang out over the water as the boat drifts down the canals. It's this wonderful trip around the water town and it's lined with shops and restaurants and walkways and pathways. There's camphor trees and sweet olive and they've, they're so tall that the branches meet in the middle and it's like you're going through a cathedral of trees. We're floating under the canopy of 50 foot tall camphor trees, which are just beautiful and the shade is deep. I can hear the birds singing and I think my heart is breaking. It's such a powerful experience. The, the water, the, the play of the light, the sound of the birds. It's so incredibly beautiful here. I can't stand it. The beauty of everything around you allows you to reflect the water, the trees, the gentle swaying of the gondola really allow you to be with yourself. Even amongst all these people, there's a sense of serenity here. I can just imagine these canals hundreds of years ago, people walking along with their sweeties. It reminds me of Venice, very romantic. It just feels so ancient, it's so peaceful. And as a designer, we try to replicate this type of feel and look to create this charming location or charming vista. And this being so natural and so authentic is really strikes me. I think I want the boat to go as slowly as possible so I can take as much time to enjoy the canal as I can. When I see the space and I'm floating through this wonderful gondola and it, it just reminds me of all the people that I love and all the people that are around me and the good fortune that I've had in my life to be at this point in my life. A space like this is like a dream. It's like a dream that you only see a few times in your lifetime. And to be lucky enough to be here today, it's one of those days in your life you'll always remember. One of the most important gardens in this area was the Garden of Retreat and Reflection. Built by a man named Ren Lengsheng. This garden is the youngest garden that we'll see on our trip. It is only 135 years old. Such a baby, right? When you first enter the residence, you enter through the sedan chair hall, which is essentially like their garage. Then you step into another courtyard with beautiful bonsai trees and into the tea hall. The tea hall is where Ren Langsheng would have received all of his intimate friends and visitors. 
And then the hallway in the back is the more formal hallway, and that's where the government officials would sit and meet and have very important meetings. Once you're through the main hall, you kind of wind your way through a few more corridors. Finally, it opens out into the family courtyard. And the family courtyard has this incredible paving. I've been looking down everywhere I go, all of these gardens, because the paving is just extraordinary. Our guide was telling us that the painter who helped to design this garden, his concept was that the light would come down through the magnolia and cast the shadows of the magnolia blossoms onto the paving. And the paving pattern captures that shadow of the magnolia blossoms. So it looks as if the magnolia blossoms have dropped everywhere on the paving. The garden itself is centered around this koi pond here. And the pavilions and towers create great vistas and views onto the pond. The koi create a great visual experience because there's always something going on in the water and always something for you to look at. When you're in the corners of the pond, traveling through the corridors around the garden from window to window, you're always looking at the pond from a different direction. This would have been the gentleman looking at the pond, though. The women all stayed upstairs. They would have seen the pond from that window up there in their special room. But they love to sit up there, throw open the windows, and do their embroidery. And in fact, I have to tell you, it's the best view of the garden. You see the long view of the pond and the trees, the fall color is just starting in this garden and you can really see the Japanese maples kind of come into the view. It's like a landscape painting, you know, you just want to paint it. This pond and this garden is really praised for its proximity and its closeness to the pavilions and the koi pond. And so as you walk through the spaces, you're allowed to pause and reflect at each of the different locations. And really what it's telling you is to slow down and enjoy the moment. There are windows with no glass in them where you just look through. It's kind of like ancient TV. Like every time you look at this window, it's different depending on the season. In the States, we're always moving so quickly through our space and it's wide open and there's no reason to stop. We're just moving through quickly and it's so nice to reflect, to just simply take life more slowly and to appreciate every moment and every stone and every building has its own little character as it's leaning into your space. It just makes it wonderful and charming to walk along and enjoy the time of your life. So here we are at day four at the Master of the Nets garden here in Suzhou. Which is the smallest garden of any that we'll visit this week. It's only about an acre and a half. We started off our day walking through this really narrow marketplace, which led to this bright white courtyard. Surrounding the courtyard were these 20 foot high walls that were whitewashed in this white plaster. We started out our visit by coming in through the sedan chair hall. The really neat thing in the sedan chair hall was that there was an actual sedan chair. So we saw the way that the master of this garden would have really traveled around town in a box with poles and men holding him up, carrying him along the road in this tilting box. The first thing that you would have seen coming into the sedan chair hall is this wonderful map of the garden carved in wood with the details of the magnolia blossoms, the lotus flowers on the pond, the pagodas coming in from the walls. You would have seen a hint of what was to come. The halls here seem to be compatible with all the halls that we've seen so far, but yet the courtyards are more compact and more condensed. And I think it has a lot to do with the siting of this particular garden. It's in a very densely populated area in Suzhou. So I'm gonna measure it here just to sort of see exactly how wide this courtyard is. Luckily thing is, uh, my foot is actually one foot. So just measuring it. Probably about 11 feet wide is how wide this courtyard is, which is about half of what we've seen in typical gardens. We're seeing some patterns in the main reception hall everywhere we go. There's always a table across the back, a vase, and a marble mirror. The vase represents Ping, 
and the marble mirror represents Jing. The combination of the two represents safety and peace. The other pattern that we notice in the main reception hall is that the furniture is also always very perfectly placed, very square. That represented order in the family life. The father of the house would always sit on the right-hand side in the east, and the son would always sit on the left-hand side in the west. We visited the women's sitting room after the main hall. There was a couch with a table in the center. That would have been where they lounged, smoking, talking, eating, while they were enjoying themselves. The main feature in the center of the women's sitting room is a round table, which re represented yin and yang. Women's sitting rooms always had a round table for that reason. This would have been my favorite room in the house. This is the reading room. The owners of these houses were scholars. He would have spent a lot of time in this room reading. I can just imagine how nice it would have been to sit and relax in this room after doing all my work, sit and lie down on this really nice cane day bed, looking out at the view of the garden. We're seeing more of those wonderful paving patterns everywhere and really detailed pebble mosaics. There was a crane that actually had a marble eyeball and the crane was detailed with little pieces of glass. Once you step through the courtyard of the reading room, it opens out into the main garden. The main garden is all focused around one lake, which is roughly square in shape. We had a chance to see all the different areas of the garden and the concentration of the elements, the pavilions, the balconies, all in one area create this array of roof lines and sloping curves that you don't see in many of the other gardens. The buildings around the lake are considered one of the best examples of placement of these pavilions and pagodas. Many of the other gardens we've seen have longer views that expand outward. And in this garden, which makes it so unique, is everything is very concentrated and compact. So you get to see everything in a much narrow vista. The screening of the windows and the lace work was quite exquisite. And we saw a bunch of students up in the rockery so we went to see what they were doing. These were landscape architecture students sitting, sketching some of the pagodas and details of the garden. And so we met them and made some friends and I showed them a little bit about how I sketch and do a quick little sketch for them and I gave it to one of the students and we shared a smile and a gesture and though I didn't know Chinese and he didn't know English, a gesture and a smile went a long way. The original owner in the 12th century called this garden the Fisherman's Retreat. It's been restored many times over the centuries. This garden had many owners, and each owner over time had done additions and renovations to the garden to sort of make it their own. And one of the later times when it was restored, around the time we were drafting our constitution in 1785, this garden was renamed the Master of Nets, kind of an allusion to the Fisherman's Retreat but also calling to mind some other stories and poems. As a result, what you see here is a culmination of all those different additions and renovations, and it's a living history of the Suzhou Gardens. Cheese! <laughs> After we finished our tour of the garden, we went to the most famous restaurant in Suzhou to have a traditional meal. This master chef let us tour the kitchen and show us how they prepare all the different meals. Right now we're in a really busy kitchen in Suzhou. We're trying to stay out of everybody's way. I've never been in a kitchen this busy before. It is such a treat to have been invited down to see where all the action happens. This is really neat choreographed ballet of tofu and fish and things setting on fire and it was just amazing to watch. It was truly a pleasure to actually have the chef come out and introduce each of the most popular dishes at the restaurant. We got to try each one and see what we thought. And this one is the shrimp with the clear broth. Yeah. My favorite story about this one is that um, the name in Mandarin sounds just like the word for welcome. So it's a welcoming dish. Yeah, that's kind of neat. That's wonderful. It's a good one to start with. Yeah. So this one's the braised eel. 
They've taken the bones out, and they pour the hot oil in, and it. Mm. Wow. That's kind of like a very savory. It melts in your mouth. It sort of dissolves. This is the tofu with crab toe. Mm. Mm. Very oh, silky. Yeah. It's Silky very smooth. soft. Mm -hmm. It has a little bit of a sort of a buttery mm -hmm. taste to it. Mm -hmm. It's uh, kind of like a butternut squash, you know. Or like a, a seafood chowder. Or like a seafood yeah. chowder, mm -hmm. exactly. Are we saving the best yeah, for last? Yeah, we'll save the best for last. This one definitely has the wow factor when you look at it. It is so crazy. Yeah. And the chef told us this is the way it's supposed to be is crispy on the outside and tender on the inside. Oh. Wow. Wow. Okay, I think this is my favorite. I can easily see why this is their signature dish. This fish is a traditional dish. This recipe is over 250 years old. The fish itself would have come from Taihu Lake, which is really close by. The same place that all of those big, tall Swiss cheese rocks are coming from. So it's really a local dish. Very, very, very local. As local as it gets. Here we are at day five at the Lingering Gardens here in Suzhou. We started off in the sedan chair hall. And Lance and I were noticing the courtyards, the light really comes in beautifully. As an architect, one of the things that I really enjoyed was looking at all the different light wells and how they brought light into some of the densely populated areas and densely structured areas of these halls. The sedan chair hall also had some really interesting art in it. There were four pieces painted on porcelain. The four pieces featured flowers, peony, lotus, chrysanthemum, and plum, representing the four different seasons, spring, summer, winter, and fall. From the sedan chair hall, we went down another set of corridors, and it opened out into the refreshing breeze pavilion, which is where you get your first view of the main part of the garden, the original Ming Dynasty portion of the garden. This garden is all centered around a lake, and the lake is divided by a beautiful little bridge. And from this pavilion, we could see the bridge and the wisteria covering it. And as we approach one of the great halls, there's a wonderful rockery right in the courtyard in front of it. And we found out that the great hall is called the Five Peaks Celestial Hall. This hall is also called the Nanmu Hall for the Nanmu wood that it's built from. The Nanmu wood is really rare. It only grows in a certain portion of the southern part of China, so it's almost as valuable as gold. I could actually touch it and feel it. It's all around you. It's in the furnishings and it's in the structure itself. I can't imagine how expensive it is. From the Five Peaks Celestial Hall, we went through another set of winding corridors. So we spent a lot of time walking around exploring the hallways and going through all these different courtyards. And you can really get lost on the eastern side of this garden. And I think that was the point of how this garden was designed. Because you can quickly look at something and catch your eye and get turned around. And all of a sudden, you don't quite know where you're at. And what you want to do is you always want to find center, which is the central pond. And so there's a constant play between getting lost and finding yourself again. We discovered one of the many little bamboo groves in the garden. There's some lovely bamboo here. From the bamboo grove, we turned east. This opened out into a larger courtyard. The courtyard is designed around a beautiful Taihu stone, the largest Taihu stone we'll see. It's all one piece. It's called the cloud-capped peak. It's about 20, 25 feet tall, and it commands this entire courtyard. And it's an instant tourist attraction. At this point, it's Saturday. This garden is packed with people, everyone out enjoying the beautiful weather in the garden. Lance and I retreated upstairs to have a cup of tea, and actually, I think that was the best view of the stone. We were looking out toward the Mandarin Duck Hall, and you could see all the best features of the stone. The Mandarin Duck Hall has two sides. 
The gent side has the typical arrangement of chairs squared off from each other, the vase, the marble mirror. The lady side has the typical fainting couch arrangement where they would sit and smoke and talk and eat. One of the great scenes that we saw was this courtyard which had this beautiful rockery. It was called the Eagle and it was perched up really high and it's a form looking like an eagle about to pounce on a prey. I also noticed that some of the little light wells have these wonderful plant specimens in them. There was one light well we found that had an extraordinary tall stone, another all one piece Taihu stone. Really fun to look at. And what was really neat is they had these bricked carved openings, these picture windows with wonderful detail and ornamentation on them. And beyond that was light coming in from these beautiful light wells. It was a great way to solve a very technical problem. This garden is quite big. It's over five acres. It's a lot to explore. So we had to come back after lunch to see the west part of the garden. The main feature of the west part of the garden are the extraordinary bonsais and miniature landscapes. This one that I'm standing next to, I can just imagine a whole little world in here. And each one of them are so unique and so different. And they're so beautifully manicured. There's even a little fish pond where I was doing a little drawing. Very inspiring. As we walk through the bonsai garden, you go through the back side towards the mountain villa, which has this terrace, which gives you over 180 degree views of the central pond. In fact, it unrolls before you just like a horizontal landscape picture. And from there, you can see the twin ginkgo trees that splay up really high and create the framework and the backdrop to this beautiful pond. You can see the rockery to the left, and then on the right, you see the old Wisteria Bridge that we saw from the other side at the Refreshing Breeze Pavilion. Finally, there's a couple of totally adorable, picturesque old boats at the end of the lake. And the staff still uses them today to clean the pond. And it's one of the things that I really like about this space because it has a great mix of contemplative procession and whimsical adventure all at the same time. And I think of all the gardens that I've seen so far, I think this is one of my favorites. I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. We're gonna to go check out the Suzhou Museum, which was designed by I.M. Pei. I.M. Pei, of course, grew up running around in the Lion Grove Garden and went on to become an incredibly famous architect. And he's taking a lot of the elements of Suzhou architecture and Suzhou design to create his homage to his hometown. Today is day six, and I'm standing on top of the Miao Li Puming Tower, overlooking the Hanshen Buddhist Monastery. I'm five stories up. It's a little scary, but we have a view of the whole skyline of Suzhou. It's a beautiful scene. You can see it from miles away. We can see the Grand Canal from here. That's that main canal that connects the north and the south of China. Materials would have gone up that canal to the emperor in Beijing. The merchants down here in the south were the ones spending their money on these gardens that we're seeing. For me, this is my first time in a Chinese Buddhist monastery. And it was very special to me because I had always loved the ideas and the morals and the values of Buddhism. And to be able to walk through a space like this was very special to me. This temple is over a thousand years old. When we first stepped through the doorway from the Maple Bridge, we were greeted by an initial statue of Buddha and four very large statues all around him. These large gold statues represent the immortals, four gods of the directions, north, south, east, and west, and they protect the Buddha. The central courtyard is the main focus of this Buddhist monastery. And as you walk through it, you get this great aroma of incense. There's lots of people visiting today, lighting candles for Buddha. And praying to the various Buddhas. And wrapping the trees with red prayer ribbons. The main pavilion is where Buddha himself sits with his 18 disciples. As you enter the courtyard, you're flanked by what's called the Buddhas of Mercy on either side of the hall. 
The pavilion on the left contains 500 arhats. These are statues, gold statues, representing very important people. These would have been like saints. We had a chance to walk through several of the courtyards and gain access to this very elaborate tower. It was really fun to climb to the top of the tower through narrower and narrower and narrower stairs. You feel very peaceful here. This morning, we had the great opportunity to walk through the Suzhou Museum by Ian Pei. We're here at the very modern Suzhou Museum in the heart of Old Town Suzhou. This museum took four years to build and was completed in 2006. It was designed by I.M. Pei. I.M. Pei is widely regarded as a master of modern architecture. He's designed buildings all over the world and has won the most famous prize, the Pritzker Prize, which is like the Nobel Peace Prize in architecture. He's designed most notably the Central Pyramid in Paris, France. When I.M. Pei designed this building, he used the vocabulary of a lot of classical Chinese buildings and gardens that we've been seeing this week. And what Ian Pei was trying to do there was make the art stand out. In the detail, he's created such refrain in terms of how he's put everything together. From the trusses that are lining the hallways, to the muted lights that are coming through, to the framed windows that were showing the gardens just beyond. And along the way, you get this great axial relationship and access to each one of these galleries. When we first entered the museum, we turned to the east and explored the Contemporary Gallery, which has an exhibit by Canadian artist Dominic Besner. Showing great artwork with vivid colors of bulls and horses and ghostly figures. The mixed media and the large format creates a commanding view. The ceilings of these galleries are very high and it reminds me of the high ceilings we've been seeing in all of these classical homes. When we had a chance to turn west into the other side of the building, we explored a wing that contained ancient artifacts from another temple near here. Which had great exhibits of jade and tapestries, vases, it was quite a scene. One of my favorite exhibits was one that showed the different artifacts that a calligrapher would have used. A beautiful vase for his brushes, an ink pot, a brush holder. There's actually a replica of a Song Dynasty pavilion set up just as a scholar might have sat in it. It has his desk, it has a calligraphy scroll laid out, and it's actually built with some of the bamboo elements that buildings at the time might have been built with. On one side of the museum is this monumental waterfall. It's about three and a half stories tall, and from floor to ceiling is this waterfall that percolates all the way down to the ground level. And the water feature that comes down the wall, which is a smashing work of genius, comes from the northeast and flows to the southwest, which is perfect feng shui. And it's bathed in this wonderful light. In many of the gardens in Sujo, they have these great light wells, and you can tell that I.M. Pei used that technique to light this waterfall. We were standing, marveling, looking at the water, and then we looked down and noticed that the stairs themselves echoed the vocabulary of classical architecture here. They are actually lintels that have been reversed, and each of the treads show that play of form and function. I.M. Pei designed the building around a courtyard garden. The area in the middle is a koi pond, and that koi pond is very reminiscent of many of the ancient Suzhou gardens that we visited this week. There's also a pavilion in the garden, but it's much simpler than the other pavilions we've seen, much more modern. The zigzag bridge is still there too, but in a cleaner, modern form. 
Ayanpei's central focus for the pond was this rockery sculpture. It's a great contrast to many of the rockeries that we've seen at the Suzhou Gardens, where they're very elaborate. Ayanpei has done a great job of distilling that down to its essence. It's very flat and very planar, but yet it gets the same point across. He's set stones that look much more like a real mountain range. It's also interesting to me to note that he's only used a few key plants. As an architect, I'm constantly looking at differences between two things. And the Suzhou Gardens that we had seen in the past week are very elaborate, very ornate, very Chinese. And what we've seen at the Suzhou Museum was very refined and precise. And it's like a very distilled piece of art in and of itself. Today's the last day of our trip. We're here at the Humble Administrator's Garden. Let's, Let's go, go check, check it out. out. When I think humble, I think small, but in fact, the garden is actually the largest in Suzhou. It's nearly 13 acres in size. The garden itself was designed in 1509 and then renovated in the 1800s and then once again in 1949 after the liberation. This garden took 16 years to build and it's had 30 owners over the course of 500 years. And we had a chance to really take a look at this garden from three different vantage points. They're set up at the East Garden, the Central Garden, and the Western Garden, which is the latest addition to this garden. When we came in through the East Side, that section was built in the Ming Dynasty originally, but had to be completely rebuilt after the Second World War. There are several different pagodas and pavilions and vistas in a very small area. The east section of the garden looks a lot more like a regular park that we would see at home. A big lake, beautiful trees, and we even saw grass for the first time in any of these gardens. From that original east section, we stepped through a little moon gate into a courtyard in the center section of the garden. This original center section of the garden was built in the Ming Dynasty. That little courtyard had a pavilion attached, which was called the Listening to Raindrops Pavilion. This is where the owner of the house would have played chess, drunk tea, and listened to the sound of the raindrops in the winter. From there, we went into another little courtyard called the Crabapple Courtyard. The pavilion next to that courtyard displays a gu cheng, which is a 21-string instrument. This instrument is what ladies would have learned to play to entertain their guests. And the entire hall was dedicated to this one instrument. From there, we stepped through another gate into the center section of the original area of the garden. The central garden where we walk to is much larger. This whole area surrounds water. In fact, the first thing we saw when we stepped through the gate was the long east-west axis of the garden centered on the lake with the trees on both sides framing the pagoda. It's called the borrowed view, and this great vista that takes advantage of a seven-tier pagoda that's 1,700 years old that's adjacent to the garden itself. It's not even in the garden. The garden designers, when they designed it, they designed it to have that view in mind. And as an architect, I really can appreciate that axial relationship. This whole garden in the center section was designed by a painter who was commissioned by the original owner of the garden. So as you're walking through these covered walkways that meander up and down, I talked to the tour guide and asked her, why do these walkways go up and down? And she explained to me that a lot of these walkways go up and down because they mimic the ebb and flow of water. We walked all the way around the lake and got to the main pavilion. This is the biggest pavilion in the garden called the Hall of Distant Fragrance. This is where the owner would have thrown all his parties because you can open up all four sides of this hall. The north side faces the lake and that's where the scent of the lotus in the summer would have come through the hall. In the central garden, behind this rockery to the southern edge of the garden, lies the original gate to the main garden itself. We're here at the original gate to the garden. And when you enter the garden, the rockery comes right up in front of you. And there's a great Chinese idiom called kai men jian xian, which means cut to the chase. As we were walking through the garden, we crossed these zigzag bridges. And I asked the tour guide, why do all of these bridges zigzag? And she explained to us that 
Only evil spirits can go in a straight direction, and so zigzagging will lose them. We've seen a bunch of different kinds of stone in these gardens. We've seen the tall Hu stones, we've seen the horizontal Huang rocks. We've also seen a third kind today. We met the limpy stone. It's a really neat stone. It's a volcanic rock that contains a lot of metals and these little air pockets. And so we took these coins and we tapped on it. And Kelly and I had a little bit of fun tapping on it in different areas to make it different sounds. So from there, we went into the west section of the garden. This section of the garden was built a little later in the 1800s, but it still represents the Ming style. On the west garden side is this beautiful bonsai garden, and in the center part of the garden is this papaya tree. It's 600 years old. But not a papaya for eating. This papaya is used to make into a wine that's also used for Chinese medicine. There's this great stone carving that looks like a sword handle that's stuck in the middle of the pond. It's symbolism, and the whole idea behind that is it's to ward off evil spirits. In the west section of the garden, the main feature building is the Mandarin Duck Hall. This hall was built later. It's more contemporary relative to the rest of this garden. It had beautiful stained glass imported from France. The colors were absolutely exquisite. There's two areas of this hall which are called the ear rooms. These rooms were added because the owner liked to throw opera performances. The ears would have been used for the performers acting. They would have operated like the wings of the stage. It's also where the servants would stand while they were waiting to be called for the next dish. Mandarin duck halls are divided into two sides. The north side looks out on this lake where you can see the mandarin ducks and the lotus in the summer. And the south side looks into a courtyard where you could have appreciated the camellias and the stones in the winter. The framed views, the covered walkways, the pagodas, the vistas have all been fascinating to us. And I can't think of a better way to end our trip through a stroll through this beautiful garden. If I could summarize this trip in three words, it would be inspiring, eye-opening, and delicious. If I had to summarize this trip in a few words, it would be educational and inspirational. I feel like I've had my eyes open to a lot of new design elements that I can use as a vocabulary for the gardens that I design going forward. Some of the elements that I'm gonna take home with me are the architectural details, the light wells, the way the pagodas are used to shuttle water back and forth, axial relationships. There's so many examples here in this garden. They're great tricks for me to use as I go home. It has been an incredible learning experience for me and has helped me value what I do in a whole new way. I'm a little sad that I have to leave this country, but I think I'm leaving with a longing to come back because I know that I've only touched the surface.